right, here we go, gang. Syncing up all the platforms as we are ready in three. See if I can do it. Two. All right. Boom. We are live. We are streaming all over the place. Welcome back, everyone. Here we are, All In With Love Playground Conversations. I am your host, James Gardner. This is my give back. This is my little sandbox where I bring some amazing people on each and every week. We break down qualities of the inner child as it relates to their respective journeys in life, their acts of service and being of contribution to, to make the world a better playground, truthfully. And uh, today's guest is someone who... Uh, I've only met uh, recently, and yet I know there's a lifetime of connection. There's a, she is a true, a true beacon of light in this world. Devout woman of faith, devout woman of service, mother, wife, dancer extraordinaire, uh, and epic, epic human. It's my pleasure to uh, to welcome Lee Hillary Lee to the podcast. Awesome! Thanks, James, for having me. So excited to dive into some conversation with you today and just see where it takes us. Yeah, let's dance. And I'm going to start there because I use the dance analogy in my life, in my in, in business, in everything I do. It's a dance. Even in my book, I talk about dance and I have a chapter's name, dance. And, and so you, dance, you are synonymous with dance. So share a little bit out there to, uh, to, to the community at large. What dance uh, is for you and what does it mean for you? Wow, that's a big question. Well, I started dancing as a little girl, young. Um, I was born in Portland and, and grew up, you know, uh, loving the performing arts. And my mom was integral in, you know, exposing me to that, that life and and uh, so, yeah, I started young. I uh, moved to Canada when I was 10. And it was at that time that I really started getting plugged into, um, you know, a full lifestyle of, you know, this is what I want to do. I knew as a young girl and, and uh, yeah, and I love to choreograph um, and, you know, create dances and themes. I mean, I think it's one of the things that God has um gifted me it's it's almost prophetic for me you know i go to sleep at night and dream choreography and i would have to wake up and write it down because i was right. scared that i was going to forget it especially with like tap dancing i would you know start hearing rhythms or sequences and crazy stuff crazy i mean i could go down that rabbit hole for a long time but <laughs> i think for me um, and what dance has meant to me, um, because I've had a lifetime of, of up and down, you know, mm -hmm. everybody, um, but dance was really my, my mm -hmm. language and my gift that I would speak to God, mm -hmm. you know, I would get in the studio and it was almost like the spirit would just overwhelm me. Um, and that was my way of communicating and ministering to God. Um, I'm not a singer. I mean, I'd love to sing, but it's like not my thing, but dancing, that was kind of the language of my soul, you know? So, uh, it got me through a lot of really hard times. Yeah. Um, it was, you know, I wouldn't say it was my crutch, but it definitely was, um, something, something that anchored me to my faith through struggles. Yeah. I, what I love that you said a few moments ago is, it was, it was your channel of source in, in a sense of, of God. And, and the inner, as I talk about the inner child is, is synonymous in my term, in, in my lens of being creative and, and being one with this kind of artistic creative ability. Yeah. I think children all, I think we all innately have that as a child and, and whatever canvas uh, he or she chooses to express it though is, is a sense of purity and yes. you know and and what i love about your saying is that that was your your pure essence uh as uh you know as a child that 
grew into a woman uh, and, and dance was that conduit to, uh, to faith. And, and, and also importantly, what I love too, it was your anchor, truly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah, it, it definitely was. I mean, um, there was a point I was speaking to you before we went live of, you know, when I first went to university and developed an eating disorder, which lasted for a good chunk of my early, well, my late teens, early 20s. Um, and through that time, you know, yeah, dance was my safe place. I mean, my faith was absolutely for sure. But, you know, in those, those years where you don't really know how to pray well, you don't really know how to, you know, open up to people, even open up to God. I mean, there's, there's a lot that, you know, as you mature in your faith, as you mature as a person, you become guarded and, you know, and breaking those walls down. I mean, the studio is where I could break the walls down and just be authentic in my soul and my spirit and with God. And it saved me. If I wouldn't have had dance, I don't know what I would have done. And, you know, when you look back over your life and you, you look at kind of like the forks and the roads and the paths mm. that you take. Um, and I just think, wow, like if, if I wouldn't had wouldn't have had dance to be that like, safe place I could have gone off in so many different you know horrible directions that would have led probably to my destruction you know so I'm super thankful that that was always my constant mm. um, yeah so I have a question so I, I have a similar journey in, in terms of the world of the sport of rowing and, and how rowing has been a true backbone of my growth from when I was, you know, in my late teens, starting university, and also reoccurring later in my life, uh, in th all throughout my forties, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, my question, though, is, you know, hearing you talk about dance and and its and its connection to 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 God and and able to channel that, was that always the case for you? Because, uh, in uh, from my in, my situation rowing was external validation as well so i was also gauging a lot of my own worth on achieving the podium winning the sure. big races and so forth sure. and so in your world because i know how competitive the dance world is i know how yeah. uh it's body types and and you know creative ability and and all of that uh was that something that you struggled with or, or had to navigate yourself or was it always a pure thing for you? Yeah. Oh gosh. That's a really great question. So, you know, I, I fell in love with the Lord when I was six years old. Actually, I was just talking to my youngest son last night about this. Um, because he loved, I mean, my, my kids love the Lord, but at six, I chose on my own and decided that I wanted to get baptized. And I just, there was something, um, I just knew in my spirit that I needed a savior, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I knew in my heart that, you know, God was calling me in this path. I mean, my mom used to say to me, like, one day you're going to be a preacher. One day you're going to, you, you know, you are going to be doing something in ministry and I mean, she spoke that over to me, over me when I was a little girl. And I think, you know, dance at that, you know, at, in my child season, child season of dance, it was, it was just dance, right? I think as I started to experience heartache, you know, in my adolescence, um, it became more of that secret language of my soul, like my mm -hmm. prayer time, my, my faith journey. Um, it was really effluential of that. But then the, you know, the one thing that's interesting is that when I was a young girl, I wasn't the best in the class. I wasn't, you know, I didn't have the dancer facility with like mm -hmm. flexibility and all I like, I had to work so hard. Um, 
in comparison with some of the other girls that maybe had more natural ability. Um, I think my passion, like I said before, was the choreography side, was the creative side, not so much the performance side. Like I went on to perform later as an adult, but I, that's not where my love was. My mm. love was in creating. Um, so, you know, later in my teens, as I started to like come into my own and, and like rise in my ability, um, you know, there definitely was a competitive side in me, but it definitely wasn't the end all. I don't know if it overshadowed my, you know, my faith in, in dancing, you know, I don't even know how to put that yeah. into words. Um, but I definitely saw as I started to, you know, own a business, like own a dance studio and choreograph. And I saw that that was where I was thrive, like achieving accolades, you know, was in my choreography. I mean, definitely there was a fire in me that like every year I wanted to like top what I did the year before. Right. You know what I mean? Um, even though like I still like still in the studio, it was my like my time to be with God. And, you know, my mom said to me one time, she said, you know, your mission field is the dance studio. Like if you want to be a role model and go share your faith, go do it in the dance studio because mm -hmm. that's going to reach reach people and change lives. And I really took that to heart and wanted to be the best role model I could for the kids that I taught. And then, you know, I, I developed Crucible Dance Ministry kind of later, um, you know, in my third, like later 30s. Um, and that was a total move from move of God, like in my life, I, I felt being called out of you know, the, the secular dance world and more into like a ministry of dance where um, I could really implement my faith and teach dance and see where doors would open in that. And, you know, that's what led us to the mission field. Mm. Just that simple act of obedience, right? And just yeah. listening. Okay, God, where do you want me in this? And honestly, I didn't want to be in the dance world anymore. That was a god thing for sure i was wanting out of the dance world and he's like nope you're standing and this is what you're gonna do and i i listened there was tears but i listened and i said okay and i just saw him move in that mm -hmm. in my life so it's definitely been a roller coaster but he's he's been there through it all yeah i think uh, you know it's it's really interesting to to follow you on as you're talking about dance and, and that journey. And, and, you know, I think for people out there too, that don't know, I mean, you, you did dance professionally. You, you had a stint with the Vancouver Grizzlies, the NBA team when it was up here in Vancouver as a dancer. And, and so you've, you've achieved a certain level of dance and, and, um, but I love Lee that you, I, I feel it, the anchor, was your faith and you know one of which i think also prevented you to a degree from going down the slippery slope that maybe i went in terms of you know completely oh. associating my my self-worth on achievement on yeah. you know the the podium the, uh, the you know and all of that and and i and i've seen that in my life uh in, in other areas and, and as you know in, in, in the acting and, and entertainment world yeah. same thing uh, yeah and and totally. was that my, your time in new york? what's that when you were was that when you were in new york do you feel like that that was your um yeah. your slippery slope arena yeah I, I think so i you know I, well no not i think so yes definitely i when i when i moved to new york at 23 almost 24 living in Manhattan for 12 years and then LA for two years and, and being in that industry, uh, yeah. y you know, you're subjected to a lot of, a lot of things and mm -hmm. a lot of situations and, you know, um, 
maybe, maybe in my case, more situations than others. And just in terms of the way the chips fell with meeting certain people and, and so forth. So, um, you know, I, I started, that's where I really started to lose sense of who I was or who, who little Jimmy was mm. with the dream, you know? Yeah. It's, it's identity. It's all identity, mm. right? Where we find our, like you said, your worth, but like, if you don't know your I, true identity and that is as a kid, like, who are you as a kid, as a child mm -hmm. and where do we lose that? Right. You know? where at what point in your life does that start to kind of scurry away right i think and i think that's why the inner child work is so prevalent um in this day and age too not even just from a, a trauma lens or a healing lens but also just getting back to that purity that we were talking about earlier in this podcast and and getting back to that essence of us truly uh, when we lived for us, like we were walking in our truth because we we didn't know better and we weren't yeah. we weren't programmed uh, yeah. through by others through through you know expectations and judgments yeah. and as I was saying self worth and and all of that and uh, you know Absolutely. for some people in your case you know it, it's God and faith has has always been that anchor mm -hmm. and, yes uh, and and for someone like me. You know, later in my life, I started to go down a spiritual path, uh, and and getting back to um, that essence, that that you know, source essence, whatever whatever we want to call it for for each of us. Yeah. Uh, and and to me, that is getting back to the purity of my younger self. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's beautiful. I mean, everybody's spiritual journey, faith journey is different and i think one thing that's lacking right now is just respect of that you know that everybody has their own way mm, right true and right. and there's no timeline on someone's journey you know what i mean like and we're all climbing the mountain at different speeds, some people are running up the mountain, some people are trudging up the mountain, and every day is a battle. But it's like, where has our compassion and humility and grace gone in society? You know? 100%. So let's talk about that. Yeah. Where, where has it gone? <laughs> well, you know, what I believe is that you know, we're fighting a spiritual battle. I mean, we're, it's not flesh against flesh. I, it's, it's the spiritual realm that is really battling for souls. And, um, you know, when we look at cancel culture or the d divide in politics and the p political realm, um, you know, when you look at what's happening geopolitically overseas and, um, you know, even the whole debacle over, you know, COVID-19 and the, and the, you know, what's right. It's like everything has a spiritual element to it. And the minute we allow our value systems and our moral compass to be tainted or misguided, it opens up this door to destruction. You know, and I think that is what we're facing today that has allowed so many people to lose their compassion, to lose their source of love and light. And, um, you know, and I just believe the only way that we can do that is to get back to our creator, to get back to his original design for who we are as human beings. And that's to love one another to love him and to cul cultivate the earth, cultivate mm -hmm. and make good of the earth. Um, but I mean, we, we see that that is not happening. We are so far mm -hmm. from that original design. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a hardness of heart, right? There is. There is. You know, it says in the Bible that in the end days, good will be called evil and evil will be called good. And that's what mm -hmm. we see happening today.
Mm. Right? Um, yeah. The, um, this concept of, of, of energy and frequency. I, I, I talk a lot with energetics and frequency and, and, you know, the, this grace and humility, as you're saying, I feel like collectively mm -hmm. over the years, over the centuries, over the years, you know, we have a certain dial of frequency as human beings and, and through everything, it's like year after year, it's like, we're, we're going down a level on the, on the FM dial of, of yeah. you know, humanity and, and that collective uh, increase in negative frequency, you mm -hmm. know, is, is having a compo compounding effect. And, and, uh, and uh, all these things that you listed, you know, are, are adding to it. And, and, you know, we, it, we are a cancel culture. We're a convenience culture. We, we, yes. we, we don't play anymore. We don't no. honor, you know, the dream. We don't honor the creativity. Not enough that's laughing. That's <laughs> wrong. Exactly. You know, what, what's pure, the, laughing, pure laughter and joy, yeah. you know, is suffering for sure. Could you, you know, could you imagine, um, I, I always have this pipe dream in my head, but, you know, like we, we, we see these world movements where like, you know, okay, at, at noon on Monday, everyone's going to, you know, take a meditation and pause and all this stuff. How about we do a worldwide collective laugh? Right. Could you oh just God. right imagine the energetic frequency yeah. of that vibrationally yeah. across the world? That would be like oh, transformative. It really sure. would be. It really oh, yeah. would be. Yeah. 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 And like the deep belly laugh. <laughs> like deep, deep belly laugh that just feels so good. I mean, I feel like after you've had a good laugh, nothing else matters. You know, it's just like your spirit is refreshed. You feel good. Life is okay. You can, you can move on. Yeah. And who, who laughs the best kids, right? Absolutely. So Absolutely. Stay yes. young and laugh. Stay young and laugh people. Yes. <laughs> yes. Amen. Um, <laughs> so Lee, switching gears a little bit, because I know there's a lot of things that I, I want to talk to you and, and I, I mm -hmm. feel like you and I could talk for hours. Yes. Maybe we'll have a, a part two of this conversation. Sure. Anytime. Uh, I do want to, I do want to chat though about, um, about the state of the present day man in the world. Uh, you mm -hmm. and I touched briefly on this when we, when we met last week and, and it just seemed like a good conversation. Um, and I'm just going to ask you straight out as a, as a woman, devout woman of faith yes. uh, and, and, a, and, a, and a woman that has selfless acts of service on a day-to-day -day basis, what do you see? Um, what do you think of, of the modern day man in, in this world? Um, the male? Mm. Well, you know, I see masculinity being attacked. I see, femininity being attacked, um, the original design of man, right, was to cultivate the earth and to be a servant and to be a provider and a protector of his family and to be a strong and wise man of faith. Um, you know, there are a number of issues, I think, on the, the political agenda that have really been compromising to that biblical, you know, image of what a man or a male should be. Um, and I think our nations are suffering because of it. I think they are weakening our nations. I think uh, we need men to be leaders. Um, to help carry our civilization and to have vision and authority. Um, and not that women can't do that either, but I mean, the creator has given man a specific purpose on earth and 
and that is being very much compromised at this time. Um, and it's scary. It's really scary because I think there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of mental health issues, men not feeling worthy enough to be men, not men, you know, uh, not knowing their place in society. Um, you know, men being scared to just be a manly man. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. And it's, yeah, we're, we're suffering definitely our culture and societies. Do you, are suffering. Do you feel that there is a, 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 a pandemic, use that term, pandemic of toxic masculinity uh, in this day and age? Well, I definitely think uh, toxic masculinity in that sense has been, um, it's, it, it, to me, it's like a smear campaign. Like we can smear anything, how True. we put labels on things and how we, um, categorize words and language. Um, I mean, definitely. I think there's so many factors that are playing into, um, you know, the propaganda of, of men and women. And when we look at, you know, attack on gen, not only gender, but, uh, race, um, you know, conservative, liberal, you know, and, and we start to mix all of these, these ideas together. Um, you know, people start to wear these labels or, mm -hmm or attach those labels to people that they don't even know, <laughs> you know? Um, but going back to the mental health part of this whole thing is that I think, you know, when you open the door to a little sin, a lot of sin can enter in, right? When we look at the number of mass shootings that have happened um, throughout United States and, and, Canada, even. Sorry, mosquitoes. Um, <laughs> one just flew right by my face. Um, you know, and, and we start to assume that every situation is the same or has an underlying, you know, that toxic masculinity. But that's not true, you know, and, and we tend to just hear hear the narrative and go along with it mm. rather than like, let's break down what is actually at the root of this problem. Mm. You know, a lot of people will say it's the guns. A lot of people will say it's mental health. And, and yeah, I mean, I think our mental health is severely damaged mm -hmm. right now in our countries. And, and there needs to be a, you know, something that helps us get back on track. And I don't know, I don't know how well, that. I, you know, I, I'm going to jump in and I, I yeah. you know, I offer, offer a few things, whether you, you agree yes. or not, yes. you know, um, you know, I think getting back to what we need in terms of grace, humility, mm -hmm. we need more love yes. in this world. And, and I truly feel, I, I feel men at, at large need to walk more with the divine feminine in their yeah. lives. Mm -hmm. And I feel that, you know, um, as you're saying, whether, whether or not what the root cause is and, and labels and narratives, I, I do feel strongly that uh, a lot of, a lot of the shit sandwich that we are eating every day mm -hmm. uh, is because of, you know, a, a history of male led decisions and behavior and, uh, and, and so forth that has come from just one side of, uh, you know, a strict, um, almost dictatorship alpha male style of perception. Yep. Uh, and, and I, in my circle, I've seen the paradigm shift with, with males. I'm, I'm, I'm blessed to know a, a good number of conscious males. Right. Yep. And, 
I think that's something that that needs to happen. I, I, I truly feel, and, and I'll take it back to just to me, and then I'll, I'll pass this to you. But in, in my case, uh, my, I guess my my uh, my final piece of of the James puzzle when I went through a midlife kind of search for me and and coming out the other side and, and stepping into my 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 true presence and getting back to my younger self was. Uh, taking and accepting the feminine in me and mm -hmm. how I show up to lead with love in everything I do. I yes. felt like that was my secret sauce that then created, yeah. the, just catapulted me to the next level of impact, of service, uh, uh, you know, my, 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 my footprint on the world. Yeah. So yes. uh, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, well, I think, you know, kind of going back to what we said earlier about these walls get built up, right? These walls around our heart, our soul get built up because there's this expectation that we need to be something, mm. right? And, you know, uh, talking about, you know, men who would tell their little boys, come on, be a man, you know, yeah. and, and just the the repetition of this idea that you have, you know, don't cry, be a man, mm -hmm. you know, these, these words, again, it's the language that we use that goes back to the, like the hardness of the heart. And if we're putting these expectations on our kids and they grow up thinking that they have to be or act a certain way to be a man, like this is all that a man is. Well, no, it's not men cry. <laughs> like men love and can love well men can be sensitive and that is a beautiful thing and I think and this is the crazy part is that that's what most women want they want a man that will sit and talk and cry with them and be mm -hmm. sensitive to their feelings and to their own feelings and not everything has to be like you said like this like authoritative dictator type style of masculinity. Um, I mean, where did this, these ideas come from? Right. And again, this is where I go back to the spiritual realm of, you know, the devil's a liar. He's going to tell us these lies to get us to swing to his side. And when we do that, chaos mm. proceeds. Right. right. And so I think that's kind of where we're at with masculinity and femininity. Like they're both have an identity crisis. <laughs> That's great. You know, like who is the woman and who is the man and what are we walking? I mean, we can't even, call, we can't even call men, men and women, women anymore. Mothers, mothers, fathers, fathers. Right. And this yeah. is how crazy it's becoming. Well, and you know, and, and, and there's, there's people out there that I actually kind of like this approach. I haven't really dove in to give it a lot of thought. However, you know, why does it have to be male or female? I mean, we are just, you know, we are just a human being, right? And and why, why do we, why does it even have to be that, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and that label, because we are, as you said, like we, we, we attach labels on everything. Yes. Right? And, and yeah. now, my God, I feel like, like you said, I don't even know what to call people half the time. Yeah. It's scary. You know? it, it, yeah. Out of, uh, yeah. And, and then everyone... In my opinion, again, everyone has is, is become super sensitive uh, yes. and and takes everything, you know, right to the heart, which again is truthfully is not being an inner child, is not being connected where they are ourselves because we're we're we are we are taking things personally left, right, and center. Yeah. Uh, and and so it's it's just a I know you have kids, I have kids. It, it's it's a volatile world out there to to bring to raise kids. And obviously, you know, w with you and your faith, uh, that's provided you, uh, a, a, a safe haven in, in the storm that's, that's out there, you know? So, um, yeah, I, you know, heavy stuff, heavy stuff. And, and, and it's hard. And I mean, <laughs> you know, there's always going to be, you know, people that disagree with your stance or have different ideas, but that's okay. And I think we've lost the art of discussion and debate in our society. And like you said, the 
the idea that we can laugh at things. There's mm. so much scent, like sensitivity, like people are so sensitive and yeah. take offense. And it's like, no, we, we need to be able to talk about these things and not cancel each other out because we disagree about one or two or three things. Mm. Like there's more that binds us together than divides us. And we Love have that. to be able to see that as, you know, human beings. So that, I mean, that's my thoughts. It's like, I, I just, I mean, I'm starting to really sense that in our world right now is just like, I don't like what you say. You're done. <laughs> You're done. Moving on. <laughs> I mean, that's, I've, I've been a victim of that. Like I, I, I mean, I would never do that. Like I, I love people. And I mean, that is my biggest prayer that in these days that my heart remains soft yeah, and not hardened by, you know, acts of unkindness, right? How do we, how do we stay above that and, and stay loving people? Beautiful. So. Uh, what I'd like to do, um, Lee is, is, Let's uh, let's shift our own narrative for a moment. Let's let's shift our own discussion topics. Let's get back to the playground here in, in sure. the last five minutes. Let's lighten up and 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 chat a little inner child stuff. And mm -hmm. and uh, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. Um, and and just uh, love to hear your responses. Okay, so yeah. uh, in in my book in in my journey, uh, little Jimmy has shown me that uh, the way that uh, that I operate in the world is by four four key compass points, if you will, okay. uh, and and they are truth, freedom, artistry, and intimacy. Uh, and those are those are my decision makers. Those are how I navigate life on a day to day basis, from yeah. from micro to macro um, situations yeah. and experiences. So, mm -hmm. what what does truth mean to Lee? Let's look, I'm going to ask you truth. What does truth mean to you? Well, I believe in absolute truth. I believe there is an absolute truth. And, um, you know, my truth is the Bible. I mean, all my foundations come from the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, and and I know that that doesn't resonate with, with some people, and that's fine. But that, that is my truth. I mean, I, I don't resonate with having my own truth. I resonate with the truth. Okay. <laughs> And, and that's, you know, what has given me the, the foundation for my life. That has, that's what's brought me through to where I am today and continues to every day. Um, I don't think truth is subjective. I, I believe that there is absolute truth. And I think this is where, um, you know, when we look at a moral compass, you can't have a moral compass unless you have a creator that has told you what good and evil is. You know what I mean? Because if we don't have those foundational breakdowns of good and bad, then it's to our own discretion. Mm -hmm. And that's where it gets a little, that's where it can get a really like rocky foundation because then what your truth is, is your truth and somebody else's truth is somebody else's truth. And you can't ever have a common medium right but if we look at the foundational truths of what good and evil is then that there, there's no breaking that there's no going beyond the limits of what that looks like so for me that's true yeah. love it love it my my closing question to you lee would be or is uh in in my journey in the book, I talk about uh, there's a doorway for all of us that uh, inevitably at some point we walk through the, the child within walks through to adulthood and some days or sometimes that happens earlier in life than yeah. later. Yeah. If you could go back to that moment for you uh, and uh, channel little Lee. Now, what would what advice would you give the the lead that is about to take a journey into this adult world? Wow. 
oh, slow and steady. <laughs> mm. um, you know, for a lot of my life, uh, it was very fast, very busy, very go, go, go. And I can see how that wore on me and, and uh, drained me a lot of, from a lot of my capacity um, and caused many sleepless nights, you know. And I think this is where my life has changed a lot in, in the last decade, just primarily from my spiritual practices of, you know, slowing down, having quiet time every day, resting on the Sabbath, you know, really like totally giving that day to God. Um, and having simplicity, just mm. living a simpler life. And I often joke about this, like, man, if I would have known this like 20 years ago, right? How different life would have been, <laughs> you know, like we always go back and be like, what if, you know, I would have known these things or done these things. And I mean, and I have no regrets, like no regrets in my life at all. I'm very thankful for the highs and lows and the adversity that I've had in my life. Um, but I'm very, very grateful today that I'm on this slow and steady path of, you know, just living one day at a time, living for that adventure for, you know, the next door that God's going to, you know, open for me and my family. But it is a very, very much a discipline of being slow and steady. Mm. Love that. It's a beautiful thing. And, and, I love that you are willing to to see what adventure unfolds each and every day. Uh, that yes. is a that is a beautiful beautiful gift that uh, our younger selves did so well back oh, in the day. Yes. And uh, yeah. yeah, I want to uh, I want to thank you, Lee, for yes. taking time out of your day to uh, to share some conversations and some some insights into uh, into your world into uh, you know, into this conversation of today, uh, specifically of, of getting back, uh, increasing our, our units of grace, humility, and love in the world and, uh, and walking, walking hand in hand with the younger selves. So I appreciate you. You are an amazing, amazing human Thank you. Thank who, you. who lives a selfless life. And, uh, as I said in the beginning, when I introduced you, you, you truly are a, a light for others. And, uh, I know, uh, you are God smiling on this, uh, on this live right now. And he's like, that's my girl. Aww. Keep going. So thank you. Thank, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And, you know, I would love to open up more discussion in the future. Uh, this is, this is my jam. So anytime. <laughs> I love it. Have awesome. some laughs and good talks. Amazing. Great. I love that. I love that. We'll do for sure. We'll definitely get you back on and, and keep going for sure. Great. Thanks, James. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, uh, for tuning in. Uh, we have some really great comments on the comment board. Sorry, uh, Barbara Shepard, we were in, engaged in a, a deep conversation, but uh, between myself and Lee, we will definitely get on there and, and respond to some of the questions and some of uh, your comments. Thank you. Thank you to everyone out there. Uh, thank you for tuning in wherever this finds you. Uh, on the live, on the replay, on the podcast, uh, whatever platform it finds you. Thank you. This is uh, this is my little give back, my little uh, ode to little Jimmy, all in with love, my journey to the hero within, which is available worldwide now at over 50,000 booksellers online. So you can find it everywhere, Barnes & Noble, Indigo, Chapters, Amazon, you name it, Apple Book, Google Play. It is out there. It is a story uh, of rediscovery of play, love, curiosity, wonder. Uh, and I would welcome all of you to take the journey as I move forward here in this world with my younger self who is uh, sitting next to me. All right. Mad love to all of you. Thank you. We'll see you on the next episode. Bye for now. Cheers. <laughs>